Good evening. My name is Beth Ann Patrick. I'm the VP and Programs Committee Chair at the Penn Faulkner Foundation, and I'm so excited to have you all here with us tonight. We have a wonderful program. Our second literary conversation of the 2021 season and it's called Refuge. So let me tell you a little bit about Penn Faulkner and then I'll introduce our amazing panelists and moderator. For those of you joining us for the first time, what you should know about Penn Faulkner is that we are a nonprofit literary organization in the DC area with a mission of celebrating literature and fostering connections between readers and writers to enrich and inspire both individuals and communities. We fulfill our mission by administering two national literary awards the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, and the Penn Malamute Award for Literary Excellence in the Short Story, as well as through our education programs, which bring free books and author visits to DC public and public charter schools. Our Literary Conversation series is now on its virtual platform. We are in the second season with this and it's just been a wonderful, wonderful response we've received from you, our participants. A couple of notes about our webinar this evening. There will be a short Q&A session at the end of the event. So please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You can also upvote your favorite questions and we'll do our best to get to them in the time we have. No promises, but we do try very hard to answer whatever we receive. We're very proud to have adopted a pay what you will model for our literary conversations in order to increase accessibility to our programs during these tough times. If you're able, please consider making a donation to us through a link that we'll put up in the chat. Any amount you give will go directly towards ensuring that we can continue to provide high quality programming for our audiences across the country and now even in other places in the world. It's time to get this conversation started. We are so honored to have some incredible people tonight on our panel about refuge. And here they are in no particular order. I'm going to introduce our panelists and then our moderator. Alexander Heyman is the author of The Question of Bruno and Nowhere Man, both from Vintage. The Lazarus Project, Love and Obstacles, The Making of Zombie Wars, The Book of My Lives and My Parents, an introduction, This Does Not Belong to You, is a memoir that came out in 2019. Alexander is working on his next novel, tentatively titled The World and All That It Holds, as well as a work of nonfiction, How Did You Get Here? Tales of Displacement, Oral Histories, and that's coming out from Farrar Strauss Giroux. How Did You Get Here was the recipient of a recipient of a Penn Jean Stein grant for literary oral history in 2017. Heyman is the winner of the 2020 Dos Passos Prize. He co-wrote the script for The Matrix Four with David Mitchell and Lana Wachowski. Abdi Noor Ifton lives in Maine currently. He's stuttering, studying political science at the University of Southern Maine and plays soccer each Saturday or did in the before times with a melting pot league of immigrants and American citizens. He is just an amazing author and we're really looking forward to hearing from him. Suvankam Tamavangsa, who is our third author on the panel, was born in the Lao refugee camp in Nong Khai, Thailand, and raised and educated in Toronto, where she joins us from tonight. She is the award-winning author of four books of poetry, and her fiction has appeared in Harper's, Granta, The Paris Review, Plowshares, Best American Non-Required Reading 2018, and the O. Henry Prize Stories 2019. 
last but far from least, our moderator, Matthew Davis, is the founding director of the Alan Chu's International Writers Center at George Mason University. He's the author of When Things Get Dark, A Mongolian Winter's Tale, and his work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Washington Post Magazine, and Guernica, among other places. He has been an Eric and Wendy Schmidt Fellow at New America, a fellow at the Black Mountain Institute at UNLV, and a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellow to Syria and Jordan. And with that, I am very happy to turn things over to Matt Davis, our moderator. I hope you enjoy the program this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello, everybody. How is everyone this evening? Um, thank you, Beth Ann, for that lovely introduction as we all come on screen. I hope everyone is doing um, well here in the DC area. It has, was a lovely day, so thank you for spending a lovely evening with us tonight. Um, we're going to start by read it with readings from all the uh, panelists today, everyone that, all the writers that are here. And we're gonna start with Abdi. So I'm gonna ask for Abdi to please share a brief reading with us to start us off. Abdi? Thanks Matt. <clears throat> Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm gonna read from my memoir, Call Me American, which came out in June 20th, which happens to be my birthday, <clears throat> not a real birthday. I don't even know when I was born, 2018. Um, the chapter I'm reading from is called The Message from Mogadishu and it's on page 199 of the book. Here we go. There was a bomb in the house. I told my brother, I can still smell the powder. Everything is destroyed. I have nowhere to sleep. Tell Team Abdi it's a scary night. That night I slept at the corner of the street in a dusty space behind a neem tree. When I woke up in the morning, I learned that Team Abdi had put together $500 to buy me a plane ticket out of Somalia. I did not know yet where I would fly to, but I would need to get a passport. I went to the government immigration office downtown. The guard at the gate sneered at me. A passport costs $80, he said. I fished a hundred dollar bill out of my pants and unfolded it in front of him. He took uh, his look of disdain changed to respect as he opened the gate. The clerk inside took my picture. I filled out some forms and within an hour I, uh, I was clutching my new Somali passport. Well, that was the easy part. Where was I going? What country would give me an entry visa? While I was getting my passport, Team Abdi learned that I could fly directly from Mogadishu to Kambala and get a one-day Ugandan visa upon landing. That would give me 24 hours to find a way from there into neighboring Kenya. I went to an airline agency at KM4, showed my passport, and bought a ticket to Kampala. Well, the clerk didn't have to ask if it was a one-way ticket. My flight was in three days. The safe thing would have been to lay low in Mogadishu until then. But I would not leave without saying goodbye to my mother. So the day before my flight, I stashed my plane ticket and phone number under the debris of our house and made the dangerous minibus journey one last time to the miserable Alasha Biha. The first roadblock was manned by the government soldiers and was easy enough. They just asked where people were going and checked to see no one had long birds. After that, we, ent we entered Al-Shabaab territory and the road was blocked by about 10 checkpoints. At every uh, at everyone, the birded fighters would, would board the bus and would sure that all women were sitting in the bag and not touching any men. Then they looked around at the man, checking their, hair, their haircuts and their teeth for brown, uh, for brown cut stains, which would indicate a non-Islamist and possibly a government spy. Anyone who looked suspicious was dragged out of the bus. 
someone suspected of working for the government might get beheaded on the spot. Man with hair too long might only be forced to endure a rough haircut. I was glad I did not force myself to show no fear on my face. I just acted like a regular guy who lived in the camps like Al-Shabaab and had gone to run errands in the city. But since I was trembling that someone would recognize me as the recruit who had deserted after just one day. Mom was cooking over a fire outside her new hat when I arrived. I whispered to her that I was leaving the next day on an airplane. And she stopped steering, steering her pot. She could think of nothing to say. And finally, she told me she was happy and that this was a good thing. I said goodbye to Nima, my sister, and told them both that not to tell anybody about my plans. And wherever I go, I hope I'll see you again, I said. Then I shook hands with my mom. Under Al-Shabaab, it was forbidden for a mom and a grown-up son to give a hat. And there was no point in risking attention anyways. The bus back to Mogadishu was scary because the fighters didn't like to see people leaving the camps. I was pulled out and interviewed three times before. I made up so many stories. At one point, I would say I was going to protect our house from burglars. And again, I was going to fetch uh, clothes from, for my mom, uh, whatever I could think of. Every time they let me go, well, that night I slept for the last time in my hidey hole, which I had cleared of enough debris in order to crawl in. The next morning, my mom showed up. She had taken a bus from the camp. Mom, why are you here? I was worried her presence would attract attention. I wanted to say goodbye to you, she said. We walked together to the airport. I had no bag, no extra clothes, nothing that would look like I was going on a journey. Just a guy taking a walk in the neighborhood. While carefully hidden in my clothes were my plane ticket, my passport, a freshly charged phone number, uh, uh, phone, cell phone, and $70. The airport terminal entrance was guarded by Ugandan army from the African Union mission. A soldier barked at us, only passengers allowed. I fished out my ticket. He inspected it warily. You may enter, he said, not her. I turned to mom. So this is finally goodbye, I said. Goodbye, my son. I'm so happy for you and I will pray for you. That's the end of it. Thank you, Abdi. That is, um, that's the end of your harrowing account of, of uh, leaving Somalia. But um, in many ways, I mean, you've had an incredible journey before that and another incredible one that is about to happen to you once you, you do leave Somalia. Um, and I was, you know, I was really struck later on in the book um, when you do land to the United States, the, the, first, um, the first job that you get after you return, or after you get to the United States is you're working for an insulation company. And you are, you're meeting all these men that are working for the insulation company and, and you're having a little bit of a, of a hard time with them, both figuring them out and, and the way that they're treating you. And it was, it's an amazing passage that you write because you compare the tribalism that you experience in Somalia to the tribalism that caused you to, to leave the country, the, the tribalism that has caused your country so much difficulty. And you sort of compare that with the tribalism being exhibited by your coworkers in the United States, even though they would probably never acknowledge that it was a, a form of tribalism. And I was, I was so struck by this because I think so much of the conversations about refugees or immigrants to this country um, and the challenges, they, they revolve around the challenges of assimilation of the struggle of fitting in to the host country or culture. There's often so very little conversation about the insights and knowledge that people like yourself bring to and about our country. I was wondering if there were other examples besides this one of tribalism where, you're, where your life in Somalia provided you with insights into the United States and, and the new place that you had, you had found home. Thanks, Matt. Well, you know, what, what is so interesting is now it's six years since I've, I, I have moved to the United States and day one, right at the airport, you know, first time landed in the US uh, from Kenya. It was 
sort of striking that you have to fill up some forms and you know as you sign the paper it felt like I was shedding a layer right I, I'm no longer a Somali um, I actually am no longer an African by you know by by birth of, of a continent so I, in other words I become somebody else a combination of two words an African-American um, or the black man so I fit in that box uh, with millions of others um, who live in this country uh, speak different language, uh, you know, practice different cultures, different faiths and all of that. Um, that to me was striking because mm -hmm. I have not, you know, lived in, 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 in a way that I could identify that way. Uh, Somalis are very proud of their, you know, clan uh, stories and we're all connected to our, to our families and the family becomes a clan. And that is, you know, how I grew up. That's what I understand. And it's a pretty homogenous society where we're, we don't really have several languages and, you know, uh, several different colors. Um, with the interesting thing that you mentioned in Maine, uh, my first job, I think every day that I wake up going to that job, I was feeling numb all over my body because mm -hmm. I, there's, there was no way I, I could fit in, you know, as much as I tried um, until I realized eight hours, nine hours, I'm working with these folks. I feel like I don't exist, right? Uh, right. And to them, it's not only that I'm a black man, but it's also that uh, you know they see me as as a stranger, uh, somebody who doesn't fit into their you know into their lifestyle. And um, you know they are not only Americans, but they are also tribalistic Mainers. You know they they right. they, they stick to themselves and they have the accent. You know. And so other folks are even sort of like outsiders, but then, you know, let alone a, a, a black man who's has an accent, who just got in and practices Islam, you know, these all things seem to them, you know, I don't fit in, right? And um, uh, as much as I tried, it, it didn't work out. Um, but I'm glad I was at least communicative. And I said, well, is there anything that I could explain? Um, if you want to me about, ask me about my story, I'm happy to tell. But if you treat me as someone who doesn't who doesn't understand the sarcasm, uh, because I think that's one thing that they have been laughing so hard, they would just throw one sarcasm out there and I couldn't get it, you know. And yeah. then they make fun of it. They talk about it for a whole week, like he didn't get it. You know, he didn't get it. And that doesn't mean I'm less. You know, the right. thing is, I I speak a language myself that you know I perfected everything. You know, I could make jokes. Um, and if you were new to Somali, if you have just been learning Somali, you know, I could, I wanted to help you, right? So that's one thing I didn't receive um, with this Fox. Um, so that was definitely quite a shocking experience to start with uh, in the state of Maine. And, um, and in general, it's America. America identifies you by the skin color. And so as I walk around every day, I'm no longer the, the you know, the tribal guy who comes from Somalia. So I become uh, a black man, uh, that, that's, that's the description that I have. And then the funny thing is, is, uh, is that okay with me? Do I, do I like to be identified by the skin color? Uh, I'm not sure if it's okay with me or not, but it's, it's, it's still strange. You know, I, 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 I don't fit into that, you know, way of life where I would like to be identified by the skin color. Uh, I like to be humanized. So if you want to humanize me, just treat me as a human being like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but we're in America. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that answer. Um, and we're going to uh, talk a lot about these issues later on in the course of the evening. But I want to turn to to Vankam and, and ask her if she could could read um, a bit from from her work and and then talk to her for a bit. Vankam. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, just hearing Abdi talk about. Um, coming to the country, it reminded me of my own parents the, when they had never heard of snow before. The closest thing they um, knew that was cold was ice cubes. So when they landed, they said, oh my gosh, look at all those ice cubes. Um, I wasn't even dressed properly. I was uh, one, years, one year old. I was a one year old. I had bare feet um, and a sponsor who sponsored my family from 
um, the Lao refugee camp in Nong Khai, Thailand, took off um, his fur hat and put it, um, put my feet in them so that um, I, I wouldn't be cold. Um, we didn't know the language or each other, um, but you know, did we, did we have to know, um, you know, that act itself um, was, was so important and made my family feel so safe. Um, I'm going to read from my short story collection. I'm going to read a story called Randy Travis. For those of you who don't know, um, perhaps because you're very young, uh, Randy Travis is a country music singer it, and um, he was very famous. He still is to me anyway. And just so you know, I am a fan of Randy Travis. Randy Travis. The only thing my mother liked about the new country we were living in was its music. She especially loved American country music because it reminded her of the way the women in her family talked among themselves. It felt familiar, the pleas, the gossip, the dreams of the big city, what it was like to come from a place no one had ever heard of. The songs always told a story you could follow, ones about heartbreak or about love, how someone can promise to love you forever and ever, amen. The songs my mother loved most were by Randy Travis. My father was nothing like Randy Travis. No one noticed who he was or what he did for a living. He was no star. He was no leading man. He packed store furniture into cardboard boxes for a living. No one would pay to see him sing. My father thought it was ridiculous to be moaning about love so much. What kind of man was Randy Travis? with his health, his looks, his fame, and his money, that he should ever have anything to cry about. One morning, my mother gave me some money to buy one of those teen magazines we could find, um, so we could find a mailing address for Randy Travis. She brought out a card printed with a pink heart on the front, but because she couldn't read or write English, she told me to write a note to him for her. I did not know what to write. I must have been about seven. What could I know then about the language of adult love? While she curled a few strands of her hair around a finger and broke out in small fits of giggles, I stood there unable to decide how to even begin a sentence to him. I didn't like how she was acting, and I was afraid of what would happen to my father if Randy Travis ever, ever wrote back. So I wrote, I do not like you. My mother would never know what I had written. I told her I wrote, I love you forever and ever, just like his song said. She smiled and then signed her name underneath. We sent these cards to Randy Travis again and again, and though no one ever wrote back, my mother insisted we keep on sending them. I tried to think of what to write and thought of the things people wrote in the bathroom at school or spray painted on the brick outside our building. You're ugly, go back home, loser. We must have sent out hundreds of these cards, spending money on stamps and envelopes, my mother always hoping to get something back. It wasn't any different than what she had done to come to this country, she said. Thank you. Thank you, Suvankam. That was um, that was beautiful. I I I loved this collection of stories, and I loved Randy Travis in particular. So I'm so glad you decided to read from it. It's an amazing collection. 
Um, and I think, you know, there's a line at the beginning of, of this short story, Randy Travis, it's, it's uh, you write a laugh in any language was a laugh. And your stories, including the one that you read from, there's just an, an incredible amount of, of humor in them. Even when you're exploring really difficult emotional terrain, like the excerpt you just read from, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you, as a writer, how you decide to weave humor into your writing and, and how does laughter sometimes supersede, you know, cultural barriers like language? Because I think that's, I think that's exactly right. So how, how, does, how does humor weave into your work and, and how, does, how does laughter and humor supersede that, that cultural barrier? Well, anytime that we hear about immigrants and refugees, they're always incredibly sad or they're very traumatic stories. Um, but from my own life and from my own family, I know that we have a wider view of ourselves. We're also incredibly funny, um, rambunctious, loud, and we're we, we've um, felt the complicated feeling of being ungrateful. Um, so I wanted the stories to pick out other feelings to talk about. One of the things that my stories don't do is try to explain that um, the people in the stories are human beings. I assume that you know. Um, <laughs> um, you, for me, it's not a big deal to be a refugee. Everyone we know, everyone we're surrounded by is. What is a big deal is to be a writer. Um, so when you talk, when you, it, when you, when you notice the laughter, it means so much to me as a writer because you're noticing a feature that is so important to my stories. Um, laughter is power. You know, um, if you, you, you can turn a situation and reframe it and make um, the people around you see what you see and laugh along with you. But also it can be divisive, you know, when, when someone tells a joke, who's in that joke, who's outside of it, who's at the, who, Who's, who's, who, wh what does it cost to tell that joke? Um, I, I'm thinking in particular of um, laughter when, um, when um, I didn't know how to pronounce the word knife when I was a little kid. And when I came home, my parents, I didn't, you know, I felt uh, I, my parents didn't make me feel embarrassed or ashamed about not knowing the language. Um, instead, we made fun of everybody at school. Uh, my dad said, what the hell? There's a letter right there. It's the first letter. Why, why, why put it there um, and not pronounce it? And these people call themselves call themselves educated what's that all about and you know like or if I have a hole in my shoe and my parents couldn't buy me a new shoe my parents would say um wouldn't go on about the fact that they couldn't afford a shoe they would say well you know summer is coming and um it's just air conditioning, natural air conditioning. Um, your shoe will be the rage when summer comes around. And then we would laugh and we would forget that we couldn't get me a new shoe. Um, that's a beautiful response. Thank you. And I, I, that, uh, that image that you started with um, when you were talking about Abdi, about the, the man putting your foot in, the, in his hat was, was also just a, an amazing image. Um, but someone that knows a lot about uh, humor and laughter is uh, Sasha. Your 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 works often um, have have humor coursing through them, and, and I wonder if you can um, share with us a reading from from one of your works. Um, my parents also came as refugees to Canada. I was in the United States at the time because I had arrived a little earlier. It's a different, longer story. But I wrote a book about my parents called My Parents and, and their um, life uh, before and after their displacement. They were 
they left Bosnia in the early 90s because there was a war. And they still live in Canada. And so I, I wrote a book in which I wanted to engage with the way they think about the world and how displacement affected um, the way they think about the world. Um, so this is from the chapter on food, which is by far the longest chapter in the book. <laughs> um, the value and meaning of food is always necessarily altered, just like everything else, by displacement. For one thing, our food is in either unavailable or scarce in the new place. At least it was at the beginning. Therefore, it becomes a mark of loss, which makes it essential for all nostalgic discourse. For years after their arrival, my mother would deliver analytical soliloquies on, say, the ineffable yet substantial differences between our sour cream and the Canadian, their kind. The authenticity of our food exactly matches the authenticity of our life in the past. Conversely, the inauthenticity of our life in displacement can be tasted in their food. In Mama's discourse, our sour cream is a stable category possessing unchanging qualities correlating to the unchanging authentic principles that guided our previous life. The principles that were violated and indeed destroyed by the war and subsequent displacement. Our food, in other words, stands for the authentic life we used to live, which is no longer available except as a model for this new elsewhere life. It is therefore important that the food related practices from the previous life be reconstructed in the new context. The food, if made properly, might be where authenticity is partially restored despite the displacement. While that authenticity was available in the previous life, it requires tremendous effort to rebuild it in the new one, where the torturous possibility that nothing could ever be the way it used to be is continuously present, like a big nose on a face. This idea is best expressed in a story I heard in Sarajevo from someone who had heard it from someone else who in turn knew the person who knew the person to whom all this happened. In short, the story is as true as can be, even if I fact check none of it, because it accumulated relevant experiences and value while passing through other people. So, a Bosnian refugee, let's call him Zaim, ends up in some small town in England. Life is tough, there are few friends, the family is far away, the longing for Bosnia is painful. Zaim develops a craving for spit roasted lamb the most universally revered food in Bosnia. He wants to do it the way it's supposed to be done, stick a whole lamb on a spit and then slowly revolve it for hours over fire and embers, sipping beer and talking to people until it's finished. Though piecemeal lamb is available in English butcher shops, a whole one is not. Spit roasting a whole lamb is quite a different proposition from roasting a leg in the kitchen oven. For one thing, with the leg of lamb, the ritualistic communal aspect is absent. There is one place, however, where Zion could get a whole live lamb, a pet store. Zion purchases a cute little lamb at a pet store, and it even has a cute little name. Wholly unfazed by the cuteness, he slaughters the lamb and spit roasts it. But this is England, where pet welfare is far more important than the longings of a carnivorous refugee. A municipal representative knocks on Zion's door to visit the little lamb and check on its well-being. Lamb go away, Zaim says in his bad English, but the visitor does not understand. Lamb go away, he says, the lamb escaped. Whether the pet welfare official believed him enough to summon a municipal posse that could search English meadows for the lost, lost little lamb, I do not know. But the story continues in the United States where Zaim is re-displaced, landing in some town rife with malls and mega markets. There is everything there except, of course, a whole lamb, which he cannot find even at the PetSmart. In his profound craving for spit roasted lamb, Zion purchases all the pieces needed to assemble a whole lamb. The head, the neck, the breast, the shoulder, the chops, the ribs, the legs. When he collects all the necessary parts, he staples them together. So there it is, a monstrous lamb, which man in history rent asunder, but is now put back together by the determined Bosnian, who beer in hand, proudly and slowly, revolves his ovine Frankenstein over the fire. Despite the heroic effort, it still doesn't taste the same. 
Um, thank you, Sasha, for that. That was that was great. Um, I was you know particularly struck by uh, the phrase that you used um, to describe your parents' experience as as elsewhere life, and um, it was you know fascinating for me because elsewhere seems a little bit of an improvement to to nowhere, which is you know the the, the title of your your first novel, which is a really I iconic novel. And I wanted to to ask you a question about about that about nowhere man. Um, because it's been almost 20 years since that novel was was published, and and I, and I wonder, you know, looking back, how how you think about that book now, as as you've had some distance from it, and and where you think, you know, your your main character Joseph Pronick, you know, might be right now today, if we were to fast forward his life 20 years from now. Um, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I haven't read that book in a while, but. It's largely because I kind of internalize it. I contain whole scenes and moments from the book. Um, I would think it's Joseph Pronick is sort of semi-successfully aging and is probably stuck somewhere on Zoom like the rest of us. Um, but I also wonder, and I had not thought about the possibility that he could extend his or continue his fictional life rather. I wonder what he would say about these, you know, four years of Trumpism, when this is the fifth year of Trumpism, just a different reshuffle of it, um, and how he would have experienced that. It's something to ponder. Um, I think the, I'm one of those people who keeps writing about the same thing, but looking for new forms to address the same thing, and that is this crucial life in, in my life, a crucial fact in my life and my family's life, and that even goes back a few generations, and that is displacement. I, in my family, no one dies in the country where they were born. That's for, for a few generations. Um, and so in some ways, we all live elsewhere constantly, right? And there, it, it is a mode of living, and, and, it, and that's one of the things I dealt with in the book about my parents. If you cannot carry property and money and wealth around, right? What is it that you pass on from one generation to another, right? Um, it could be stories and language, but that often gets lost in transition if kids are born and raised in different countries, right? So what is it? And so this, uh, it, it, people who have grown up and lived in the same country their entire life from families that have always lived in that country, or at least for a few generations, I think they have a sort of uh, um, a fundamentally different perception of the stability and, and uh, continuity of the world, right? So for me and my family constantly operate with the assumption of possible catastrophe, right? And it could, the intensity changes, right? I do not, it's not a paranoia, right? There's always a real possibility. We analyze, scan the world for that possibility. Um, and as bad as that is, it requires imagination. And also you have to narrativize those catastrophes, the past, present and future catastrophes. And so it generates a particular kind of, of, and that could be funny, I have to tell you too, um, generates a particular kind of imagination, a particular relationship to the, to the place where we are, because no place after that, the original place seems permanent. Yeah. Even yeah. if it is, it is just that. Yeah. What, um, Abdi and, and Suvanka, I mean, feel free to jump in here. Um, but I'm, I'm also just very curious to, this, this literary conversation is, is entitled Refuge and, and there is um, you know, a sense of the three of you each came to, to North America in very different ways. Um, even though you know, you, all three of you are, are in many ways displaced from your, your home country. So I, I wonder um, if you, I, any of you wanna, discuss a little bit about how your conceptions of, of refuge and home have evolved over the, over the years since you've left from where you were, you were born. And, and Subalcom, I know, you know you're, you were very young when you came here, obviously, but your family left. Um, how, how has that idea of, of refuge and home evolved for you, both as a, as a person, but also as a, as a writer? Um, when I write books, everyone wants to not talk about the book, but to talk about my biography, like where my parents are from, where I was born, what, um, and attach me to that country. Um, I was born in a refugee camp, and in a refugee camp, you're not given a birth certificate. 
So, you know, while I can say that I was born in Thailand, um, I am not Thai and the Thai don't recognize me as a citizen. My parents are from Laos, but I have never been there myself. And the, you know, while we value a government document like a passport, the rules of what makes you a, a citizen can change any second. Um, so the only place where I feel I've made something permanent and real is when I open a book and next to the copyright mark, I see my name. Mm -hmm. That to me is as powerful as a birth certificate that proves that I'm here, that I made something and that I'm real. Um, and, um, and that, and, and because what I've made is a book, um, you know, no one can take that from me. Um, so the only time I feel refuge is in the art that I make. Great, thank you, Abdi or, or Sasha. You wanna you wanna respond or take that take that on? Well, I I mean I recognize um, Subankam's um, uh, thinking about the sovereignty and the, the homelessness of the text of literature writing of being in a place it becomes a an imaginary home right it is the place where no one asks you to explain yourself because you have full control of presentation and self-representation um, no one can get into it unless you let them in and also i think it's an, an important aspect in talking about refugees and immigrants too, uh, and citizens in various countries. It's, it, I think that one of the ways to measure the difference is the sense of agency that one has, right? So people who are kicked out of their own homes, they don't shop for the best country to go to, they go where they can, if they can at all, right? And so their levels of agency are, are smaller. And, and, and I think there's a very basic uh, law in the way people behave in the world, they move toward the space where they have more agency, where there's more food or more jobs or more schools or more loving people, wherever it is, where a person can engage with the world and other people in it with dignity, self-respect and agency. And so that's the logic of migration, right? And then we know what happens when people are, are not let in, but uh, or when they're let in, but their agency is diminished because they're taken to be second-class citizens legally or, you know, um, effectively. And so a lot of people, a lot of writers from Nabokov to uh, Suvankam, I think, and me for sure, is, is finding a place where you have a sense, where one has a sense that, that one can exercise some agency, that one can rethink one's life uh, and experiences and imagine alternative lives and just find ways to um, have at least narrative agency in the world in which other forms of agency are not necessarily uh, available. And I know this, I don't want to talk too much about it. When I been, went back to Sarajevo after the, the war and siege, right? I hadn't seen people from before the war. And so they were telling the stories from the siege and speaking of humor, um, how they survived this horrible, the longest siege in European history, modern history at least, um, how they survived. And by and large, many of those stories were funny. Right, and I, I, it, it surprised me that uh, this was in '97. So, and I had been thinking about it ever since. And so, I don't want to get a long answer, but the basic answer: they got to tell the story as they wished and change its value. Right? They survived, and the laughter was the triumph. I can tell the story of my suffering any way I walk, wish, and I will tell it as a funny story, and therefore prove to whoever wants need need proof. Um, that I have survived indeed. Right. Um, I, you know, that's an interesting question. And I would like to add, uh, when I started working on my book a few, uh, 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 three years ago now, um, I, I had realized that uh, I wasn't thinking in English, clearly. I wasn't dreaming in English, right? So, um, so I started uh, uh, pouring my thoughts and memories 
in the way that I feel, in the way that I feel comfortable and, and, and I understand my own story, which basically was my native language. And uh, just because I, I didn't grow up here, I've, I've just migrated here uh, in, uh, in, in the fall of 2014. And, um, and then I worked, started working on a book uh, 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 in, in 2000, late 2017. So, uh, so what's very interesting speaking about literature and how you, know, how you feel about home and where's home. Um, I have almost daily conversation with my, my, my childhood friends, those who survived the war. Uh, none of them is currently in our country. You know, none of them is home. Uh, people have scattered, some have crossed the desert, some have crossed the ocean, uh, some have been very lucky to, to catch a flight like myself and, and get as far as here. But what's very interesting is how we have, uh, how we really enjoy uh, going back to the sweet memories or maybe Peter memories back home. And, and we, we tell about, in a very funny way, we could start telling a story uh, that happened in 1997 at a time when we started playing with, uh, with, with some sort of like a, a, an IED and we didn't understand and then how we walked away from it and then it, it you know, it, it just it explodes, right? Uh, we, we could have died. It, could, it was like a, a 10 second, 20 second thing. Uh, but to know each other now that we're alive and to go back to those memories and that my friend is talking to me on WhatsApp or on Facebook you know, where his kids are behind him running around or, you know, making a noise. And what that makes me really is just for a, for a minute, close my eyes and say, there's a reason why this is actually happened. Um, we see ourselves as the satellite of our stories. You know, we're, we're now looking everything from above, like bird's eye view, um, back, to, back to these stories. And these were actually the major reasons why I wanted to work on a book because otherwise, these memories escape us. You know, I can't be, I can't be uh, uh, remembering everything as, as the years go by. So I realized, wow, hold on. You know, I'm, um, these memories are very, very uh, fresh in my mind. It, it, it just literally has just happened. It wasn't that long ago when I left Somalia and crossed the border into Kenya. It wasn't that long ago when I was a refugee and I still have my refugee papers in the pocket, but you never know if you're gonna lose it. So why don't, why don't I, um, you know, start working a book um, which uh, just becomes my identity, like you were saying, uh, uh, Silvacam. You know, that is how you see your 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 beingness. Like, you know, you've you've really made it. Uh, I don't have a degree in literature. I actually am someone who's never been to high school or middle school. But realizing that you are the idea behind this story that is getting into schools and that people are reading. Uh, that is home to me, you know, that is, that is what makes me feel, uh, see myself as this person and see where I live, America, as an idea that shares, you know, that we all fit in. Um, and so I think that's how I uh, could see myself. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, I'll be hearing you talk about, about longing because there, there's um, a sense of, of longing for uh, the home country in some ways that, that, you know, Sasha, you read about food and, and Suvankam in your, in one of your stories, you sort of write a little bit about how, especially the, the Laotian men are sort of longing for the privilege that they had in Laos as, as doctors and lawyers and who are now, you know, digging, um, digging worms from the ground to, to make a living. Um, you know, and Abdi, you know, you have, uh, in, in your experiences in Maine, the many Somalis who are sort of longing for the for the the order and the strictness of, of Islam in some ways and religion that doesn't exist in the United States. Um, so I wonder for each of you how that how that that complication or how that desire for longing um, maybe nostalgia, uh, but how, how that how that complicates the idea of, of identity for for you and, and for and for your characters that you write about. Well, I mean, I've written about nostalgia in various ways. And nostalgia is kind of retroactive utopia, right? It's the past devoid of all the ugly things, right? And then and, and and it contains um purified mythologized, if you wish, 
memories of home from smells to other things. But there are differences in kinds of nostalgia. There's the nationalist nostalgia, people who think, well, wow, let's make America great again because they fantasize about this, you know, pure, clean place that somehow foreigners spoil for them. Um, a personal, personal nostalgia is always fragmentary and sort of complicated. It can never be put back together. Everyone, unless they're totally delusional, think that it's not available. It can, you cannot go back to the place. The only difference is degrees of, of, of sadness, if you wish, right? And to me, that is extremely narratively interesting. You know, people create stories of their life um, before, right? So as to um, do at least two things. One of them to uh, kind of validate their life here, because when people come here, particularly the refugees, the immigrants too, sort of the the uh, the common attitude is, we don't know who you are, where you came from. You practically nothing until you prove us somehow that that you have an actually valid, legitimate history of being a human being, right? And so, uh, this is what a lot of immigrants and refugees, they have to convince, explain themselves. Why are you here? Even if to benevolently asking people, right? Why are you here? Where, do you, where, where are you from, right? Because Americans are not asked that. Self-evidently, people being self-evidently American. Um, and so it, 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 it's the history that we carry on our backs. It can only be narrative because the books, the libraries, the culture, it's hard to bring all that over here, right? Particularly after the war that destroyed it all. And the other thing is that um, reflecting back on that, it allows for some kind of native connection with the homeland. I, I cannot tell you how many people I know, they can talk about how great it used to be in Yugoslavia, Bosnia, but they haven't been there for 15 to 20 years. And so nostalgia, uh, may, they may never go, partly because if they go, it might turn out, it, they might find out that they made up a lot of it, right? Or that, that, that the fantasy of this Edenic past might, might be ruined, right? And so people then create these narrative landscapes in which they like to live. And then they might tell those stories to their children and then they can develop you know, fantasies about the former land. Whereas the reality of, the, of that land presently, right? Is not always a, a, available to them. Even with all the, you know, uh, social media, we can, we can click on a link right now and watch what's happening in Sarajevo Live, right? Or in, uh, in, in Somalia. And so it, it's both a connection and what separates people from the homeland, this sort of nostalgic operate, constant nostalgic operations. It's gold for writer. Um, no one in my collection of short stories long for home. And I don't, as the writer, I don't do the work of giving my characters or the reader their bearings. I just refer to the location in each all in each of my stories with the word here. Um, it's very plain um, and very very tiny, and nobody knows where they are where where they are as a reader. Um, one thing I want to avoid, not just for the reader or the characters I make, is this I this feeling of pity. I don't, I hate it. I don't want it. And I don't, I don't pity my characters. Um, and uh, just thinking about um, nostalgia, none of my characters think back or give you a history lesson of where they come from. But they do say it is as if the life that they had before didn't count. Um, when they had been doctors and lawyers, they found themselves now picking worms or being managed by pimple-faced teenagers. So, Matt, um, I actually have a very good friend who's a very famous musician in Somalia, particularly in the 80s and 70s. He's, he's a pretty old guy now, you know? And um, what we're talking about, the Michael Jackson of Somalia, like everybody knew his name. But then because of the war, he left, you know, and uh, found his way in, in, in North America. Um, he's a cop driver, of course. And I, for me to be able to become a translator and interpreter, you know, for, for him at the, uh, at the clinic uh, um, or, 
you know, uh, you know, the doctor's office, I, I, I didn't know what I, you know, what it feels like, should it, you know, is it privilege or something like that. But um, the, the, the words that I hear from him uh, is, even though he hasn't been to Somalia in 30 years now, is, is, is that, um, you know, that is where his, his body has, has, has to go, you know, I mean, what he, what he said was, I'm, I'm descending, you know, I'm like, you know, I've, I've really had a great time. Uh, I had packed theater when everybody came in and now I'm planning to go back. Uh, uh, and that is, you know, where, where I want um, my life to go, uh, like be rested, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested, you know, I don't think this is the land where I like my, my body. And if you, if you know, religiously, it doesn't really matter where your body goes, <laughs> you know, it's just, um, so that, that has really touched me deeply. And then the part where you mentioned in my memoir, uh, particularly in my roommates um, who said, Hey, I, I would, you know, I, I'm saving up some money and uh, I would like to build a home uh, back in Somalia. I'm not building a house here. Uh, that is where my family has to go. Uh, all we're waiting for is, is things to open up and, and peace, peace to return. And I think that the, the, the reason that people feel that way is um, if you look at it in, 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 a, in every society, there is those privileged in, you know, in every society and there's those less privileged. And to almost every character that is in my book who really wants to go back to Somalia are part of those who are privileged, you know, who feel like, you know, we, 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 uh, the clan sort of lives in, in this area. And if I go back, I could become the Sultan or I could become the, you know, uh, like a, 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 a leader of some sort. Whereas all I could, I could do here is become a taxi driver, uh, you know, work at the hotel. And between the two, I would definitely choose that because uh, I wouldn't be making money that way, but I would, I would have a, a whole bunch of people that are, uh, you know, uh, just meeting me and hanging out with me, handshakes, you know, and, and all the respect that people receive. And I think that is very natural in, in all humans. Uh, but where do I stand in that? I'm not really privileged in, in Somalia. And I've been very clear about that in my books. Like, uh, for example, now there's a, there's a system of governance in Somalia. There's a, it's 4.5. So it's four major clans and 0.5 are the minorities. So the minorities will never be able to have a position of the presidency, uh, a prime minister, uh, a speaker of the parliament. You can run for everything else. You can become a, a, a you know a cabinet member, a parliament member, but you can't reach that you know that level. And then it reminds me in the U.S. You, if you are not born here, you're not going to run for a president. And even in many cases, if you're born in this country, you still have to have you know certain connections and levels that that you need to get to become a president. So in a, you know it squeezes me in in between, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm re really not interested in craving for going back. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting, or, or you can be a reality TV show, TV show star and become president in this country. But I, <laughs> I, but I do, I mean, I think that it's, um, you know, Sasha, you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I, it just was, some of the images that were used for this discussion tonight was the Statue of Liberty sort of shattered in pieces. and. And I do think it's, it's if you're going to talk about refuge, if you're going to talk about home, especially if you're going to talk a little bit about, you know, refugees and, and immigrants, it's, it's impossible not to address what the United States has just gone through the past four or five years. And, and, and I think it's, um, I mean, it really does beg the question, is North America, especially the United States, still a place that can that can welcome people from across the world that are seeking refuge, that are seeking home, that, that's sort of in many ways has been our, our, our calling card as a country. Is that, does that still exist? Or is that, or is that, is that gone? Well, I mean, people go where they have more agency. They're, they're, uh, refugees and immigrants, they do not really shop for the best place necessarily. They shop for the relatively um, good place, right? And so, um, and so I don't, I don't know, there, there are, hundreds of thousands of refugees they, who can't get to Europe because they would not let them. There are people stuck in Bosnia because, and essentially dying in, in snow because the European Union has clo closed the borders and, and Bosnia is not part of the European Union and keeping them outside, right? And so um, 
they would be happy in Germany just as well, or Hungary even, never mind the United States. They're not sitting around the fire in Bosnia thinking, oh, let's go to the United States. They're just anywhere where there's food and agency is good enough. And so I think it's part of American mythology, um, and it, which is part of the great American myth of exceptionalism. This is the best place in the world. No nation like this in the world, exceptions, ex except from history and the, and the logic of fascism and power and imperialism and colonialism. Right, and so, yes, of course, it's better here than it, than it's Bosnia or in Somalia or anywhere else. Yes, but it doesn't mean that that uh, uh, people who come here just think, "Oh, I give us Trump; he's so much better than you know the, the corrupt uh, war criminal in Bosnia." Right, because it is the reality of this life now. Right, what you can do with your agency in this place here, as Sulankam said, here is is where we are, wherever that is, and so I think. Um, People will come here, of course, because it's a it's a it's a vast land, and there are spaces, right, all, all kinds of spaces. But I I'm going to tell you that I am less American now than I was ten years ago. Something broke, and I live here. And uh, what happened with Trump? And it's not even that Trump was possible. It is this inability to see that um, Trump was possible by a lot of people and that it is still possible and that everything that happened was always possible, not only possible, but probable. But it, there are so many people in this country who are so invested in this myth of American exceptionalism. And I think I reached a point a pretty early in Trump's reign, I can't fight this. I cannot be explaining this all over again. To me, it was always clear that they would end up attacking the Capitol. Always, that the logic of the approach, if you wish, was going to end in violence. And it is not over yet, I might tell you. Things have improved a little, but it is not over yet. Um, maybe I'm an optimist, but um, you know, America also is Barack Obama and Kamala Harris, you know, seeing faces, um, um, such as theirs in power um, that says something all over the world that too is America, you know. Um, well, I think, first of all, let's really be clear. Uh, I think millions of Americans still believe that 90% of the refugees are coming to the United States. And if you look at it, it's just the other way around. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, more than 90% of these refugees live in neighboring countries, Turkey, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, and other places. Uh, what we have is a very, very small number. Um, but then uh, this nation is built on, uh, on migration. You know, uh, for, for those who first came and started, you know, were speaking French are, are now no, no longer doing that. Their kids have evolved into, into America. And the Somalis who came to the United States in 1991 um, have children who are identifying themselves as African Americans, right? It, you know, it's that, that's how it continues. And I think. Um, in some ways, America is connected to every continent in the world uh, by nationality. I mean, you know, you can see that actually basically happening uh, wherever you go. Uh, you know, there's a family that who's, who also has another family connected to them in the United States for many, many, many years. So why not visit? You know, why not really be part of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, if, if you can't find a uh, uh, what you're looking for, economic opportunities. If you are a graduate from uh, University of Kambala and you can't find a job in your country just because of the system, because of the guy who's running the country over 30 years, you know, you have every fundamental right to decide where you want to go to. You know, it, it's, it's a human nature. We've moved, uh, we've migrated across borders forever. Uh, and this whole, uh, you know, man-made borders, you know, are still, I think, uh, in some ways, actually trying to, to level up, pushing the vulnerable ones away and, and bringing what you, that's exactly what Trump was saying, you know, <laughs> I just want half seven countries not to come to, to, the, to this country, that's a travel ban, in other words, a Muslim ban. And, and then, yeah, I want the Ireland, you know, Irish to come, English to come, and everybody else. So, 
uh, as racist as that is, but I think, uh, honestly, if you look at it in other ways, it's just that America is connected to, to every country. Um, uh, people have been supporting their families from, from day one, you know, in, in 1800, 1700, there were Mexicans who were making money in the US and that money was, was going across the border and it was building houses and communities elsewhere. And that, that has been happening, uh, you know, forever. So that's why to answer the question, I think North America is, is definitely, you know, a, a destination. It, it may not be a number one destination, but I still believe it's one of the top destinations for, you know, for the refugees. So, so come what, what is, um, for those of us that may be unfamiliar with um, how Canada may be similar or different than the United States in, in, in terms of, of how the country uh, views itself um, and how maybe people who have come to the country um, as refugees or immigrants, how it views the, the country. Can you speak to that a little bit in terms of how Canada may differ from the US? Well, um, I can only speak about it because you know I'm not a lawyer or a social worker I'm I can speak about it in terms of what my family experienced we also wanted to come to the U.S. but my dad didn't have a job like um a, an, a, being, he wasn't an engineer he wasn't educated with a PhD or anything like that what he did was he carved things out of wood and what is that in the world? Um, it was easily interpreted or read as um, a communist. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so my family was not allowed to come to America. Um, and it made also because I did not have a birth certificate, we had applied as refugees, my family had applied as refugees but then my mother had me. And so there was this undocumented third person and that's just suspicious. They don't know um, when you're applying, you know, um, how old you are or how dangerous you are. They just see this undocumented third person. And the only um, document that I could have was um, a baptism certificate. Um, but that wasn't, you know, real or good enough for America. Um, but in Canada, um, the church was allowed to sponsor you as long as you had um, a baptism certificate. And so that's how my family ended up in, um, in Canada. Wow, that's a, that's a, I, I, the idea of, of someone working with wood equates to communism is, is um, it's both uh, horrifying, very bureaucratic, and, and also I, I, can, I can see it in, in some ways. So um, we're going to move on a little bit to some Q&As that, um, that questions that the audience have, have posted. And I want to encourage all of you who are watching and listening to feel free to um, submit some questions. And um, one that I'd like to ask is uh, one of the, the people wants to know what, what is a question you wish you were asked about your books or your writing? Um, so what is a question that you wish you were asked about your books or your writing? Um, I don't know if a single question can cover that. Um, uh, and I think uh, books are continuous communication. I would have liked, I would like to be involved in that communication beyond, you know, just a and A. But of course, that's difficult and impossible. Um, it's not only that I, that I like to talk, but writing a book, as my fellow writers know, it, it means making millions of very small decisions that are totally invisible to, to the, even the best of readers, right? But I, th those decisions are my book. And so I can talk about those decisions. It's, it's kind of a, I'm not sure that's <laughs> really useful to anyone, but I made, I, I remember some of those decisions. I remember how it changed my understanding of many things of language, of the world, of myself, or particular instances of situation. Because writing a book means changing the world. It's not, I'm not, I mean, in a political sense, but 
it alters my perception. Everything looks different after I have written a page, let alone a book, which is why I'm doing it. This is the, the agency that I'm talking about. It's a, it's a way to change the world or the perception of the world. So I don't feel passive and, and just an object in the world. Mm. Um, I think I would like to maybe be asked, um, um, because I grew up in a home without books, so maybe someone could ask, um, how do you become a writer if, if, if you haven't been surrounded by books or, or you, if you haven't encountered books early in your life? And I would just pick up what Alexander had talked about in terms of the imagination. Um, my family had an imagination um, and it costs nothing um, and everybody has it, so use it. <laughs> and um, that, I think that is what guided me, even though I wasn't surrounded by books I had an imagination and I was taught to use it. Right, um, I am with you, Sylvan Cam. Honestly, I did not grow up having books in the houses, but I think one question I really like uh, people to ask is, um, how does it feel telling this story in the first person? If, if you, you know, most of the times it's a, a, a journalist who visits a refugee camp and writes about you know, those stories, um, or it's a filmmaker who puts together a documentary and it, it all goes in the, in the third person. You know, it's like, oh, I met this person and this family. And uh, those are all the books that I've actually read. It's, um, I haven't had access to read a, a firsthand experience written by someone like myself who has actually lived in the DAP, uh, which used to be one of the largest um, refugee camps uh, in the world, right? Uh, uh, but then all of the books that I visited at, uh, uh, before I wrote mine, uh, picking up, collecting things, and it was rare to find uh, a piece written by refugees themselves. So those are the questions that I like people to, to think. Is it, you know, uh, how does it feel finally standing up for yourself and for your story and for your community to say, I don't want anybody to to write about my story. You know, I don't want to sign a contract with someone and walk away and for them to steal or take this story. I, I want to speak for myself. Uh, and that is how you can change the world. Um, I want to follow up uh, very quickly with, with Suvanka in, in, in terms of, of how you um, how you did become a writer, because I, I, I am curious. I mean, you mentioned the imagination, but sort of what what were you what were you reading? What what, what when did you begin to sort of um, have your your first reading experiences? And what were those like as you were you were growing up in Canada? Um, I saw books in the school library, and you know, anytime you're in a school, you will encounter books, and um, anytime we read something. It was just so much fun. I wanted to make that thing. Now, of course, you know, my parents are not connected to the publishing industry. If I wanted to pick worms or pluck feathers in a chicken processing plant, they knew exactly who to talk to, who I could go to talk to to make that happen. I didn't know how to become a writer, but um, I just, I printed and bound my own books and sold it out of my school knapsack because I wanted to see my name on a bookshelf. Um, and I went to bookstores around Toronto and said, will you carry my book? Um, and then um, a publisher discovered me that way. And she said that, um, you know, I don't have to print and bind it myself. She, she can do that, that's her job. Um, and that was when it was really amazing to see that, uh, you know, I could, I could be a writer, that, that a writer can have a name like mine, can look like me um, and can be on the bookshelf. Um, and in libraries and in schools, 
just like Abdi said, you know, when you said um, it was, it feels so good to see that your books are in schools um, and uh, that I share that feeling. Yeah, and, and Avi, you also, in, in, your, in your memoir, you talk a lot about learning English through movies um, in particular. And yes, that was really where, you know, it sounds like you began to learn English from. And, and what about your, um, when, when you began to sort of think about becoming a writer more seriously? I know you were, obviously, there are uh, many radio stations, men in, in Mogadishu, I think is what, what they called you. But what, what would, as a reporter and as just a as sort of a diarist, but when did you become uh, more interested in, in literature and in, 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 in reading and how that impacted you as, as you as you got older? Well, if you look back way back in Mogadishu when I was learning English, um, every time that I finished a movie, uh, most of them action, Arnold movies, The Terminator, The Commandos. Interestingly enough, I would write all this word, uh, curse words on, you know, on the walls of Mogadishu. And that is how writing started for me. You know, I, uh, I would paint something at the door of, of my room um, to let my mom know that she can't come in, you know, stop privacy, things like that. Uh, but she can't read, so she came in anyways. Um, so those are, interestingly enough, how it actually got me into sort of liking expressing myself through words. Uh, when you sometimes feel, you know, feel like uh, speaking is not enough. You just have to print something out. Um, I, when I, you know, when I moved to Kenya, uh, there are books available all over the place, uh, very cheap. And I collected as many as I could. Uh, and I had so much time in my hands. As refugees, they wouldn't let us go to school, uh, find a job. So there's so much time, you know, so I, I would read a whole novel within a day. Uh, my brother and I would read each other sometimes. And when I came to the United States, that's actually when I felt this is a, you know, this is the, 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 the battlefield right here. Uh, this is where my words should come out and pour out in a paper and start, you know, coming together. And um, so, yeah. Um, that's really interesting, both, both of your answers. Um, and, and Sasha, there's, there's a question for you specifically from one of the um, people that are, that are listening tonight um, about which one of your books feels closer to you and why, and, and closer in the sense that it represents you better or in an essential way. And, and then as sort of a, an addendum to that, uh, do you feel more at home writing a short story or a novel? And I guess now I would add to that uh, more and more nonfiction. Well, I mean, as I was saying, uh, writing a book changes me and changes the way I look at the world. And so um, they represent who I was when I was writing them, but then I changed after that. And, and it's, it's, it's both a track of some kind of evolution or degradation, um, but also it is, I read them as though, um, you know, they're written by a family member who I know very, very well, but I really, it's not me. Um, and I don't read them often. I read them in because I contain the, the memory of writing them. And so I, I this book, um, it's the most recent one, but that not only that, it's, I think it was written um, with the sense uh, and a lot of thoughts about uh, in relation to everything we're talking about. And it was because I wrote about my parents, I think that um, it contains a lot of love for them in there, right? It is inescapably if one writes fiction or even you know first person there's a certain amount of solipsism right so i'm i'm speaking now and about myself obliquely or directly right and so it, it is a way to have a voice and to be in the world it's not necessarily selfish but there's a different quality in the book and when i when i was working on this book and although i knew most of the stories i would sit down and listen to my parents and i was not known for listening to my parents in the family <laughs> And so they would tell me about themselves and this sort of delay, not delay, I mean, always we had good relationship and loved each other, but somehow opened new spaces relatively late in our life. And to me, that, that changed me in a way that I still feel. And now that I haven't seen them for you because I can't go to Canada, I, I really miss them. So when I miss them, I call them on the phone, speak for five minutes, and then I read about them in my book. 
Um, Sasha, can you uh, just to speak a little bit to the differences of experiences between yours and, and your and your parents, different countries, different times? I mean, what what sort of have been similarities and what have been have been quite different? I mean, they also came as a couple, presumably, whereas you were you were single. Well, now I mean, I have a, about a hundred family members in Ontario alone, and then some in in uh, Alberta and elsewhere. And so it, it's I mean, my tribe has moved to Canada pretty much, and so. Um, but when they landed, they were the first ones and they were in their fifties. They couldn't speak English. It was very different. And they were, you know, traumatized, but they wandered around for a couple of years. They were traumatized in various ways. And then um, it was very different. I had no money. I was working minimum wage jobs. I would take a train from Chicago where I lived. It took me forever. And um, in 93, but they managed to deal with that. But I remember when, when Sulvankam was talking uh, about the difference between Canada and the United States or her family experience in Canada. When my, they, they had um, English classes for six months first, right? Because they couldn't speak English really. My dad quit because he was too nervous. He needed to get a job. He could he just he could not stand learning in a situation where he had no bread to eat is the way he would put. And then he found, found a job. He was uh, an engineer with a you know, college degree, but he found a a maintenance job in a factory, right? And then he called me and said, I can get this job, but I don't have tools. And do you have money to pay for the tools? $250 Canadian. And I didn't have, I mean, I didn't have the money because I was just paying the rent and for food. And I said, talk to your social worker. They had a social worker, right? Who then promptly lent him $250 and he got the job and he paid it back. I mean, this is news only to the Republicans, I suppose, but you actually help people. People can, you know, return that and then they help the next wave and so on. And so to me that, I mean, Canada is complicated and it's not ideal in many ways. And I'm well aware of the stories, but to them, this is when, this is what they remember 30, nearly 30, 30, uh, 30 years later, right? That at some point, someone, not just the rent, there were other Canadians, random citizens who were kind to them, right? But that the government person was kind to them actively. And there was a government policy that helped them when, when it could. And that's, um, that is invaluable. And so they are, with all the nostalgia and longing for home and loss and all that, they're very proud Canadians. They vote and they, you know, they know who their Ontario uh, premier is and they don't like him and, and all that. They, <laughs> They involved. That's interesting. That's 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 great. I want to um, ask a question uh, that someone wrote in about um, the stories and who gets to tell uh, refugee stories. And uh, the question is, I like to pick up on the point of non-refugees writing stories about the refugee experience. And, and the question is, who has a right to tell that narrative and perhaps benefit from it? I've read far too many fetishizing it and missing the mark yet being lauded. Was that a question, Matt? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, the question is who has the right to tell oh. the narrative and the story of, of refugees? I, I, think, I think anyone who owns this story has to tell this story. <laughs> That's how it works. Or um, you can tell the story of your family if they are not around or if they wanna share it with you so that you can share it with the world. Uh, I think, for example, I had a permission from my mother to tell her story in my book, right? Uh, it's her story, but you know, it's a family story. And then at some point, you know, there are uh, things that I, I was never told as a child uh, that you learn about um, as you uh, take your time communicating with your parents. And those are one of the amazing things during uh, my writing process, you know, where uh, my mom would go on and on and on talking about these things that she's never told us in our lives. But now she feels like it's the right time. And I feel like it's the right time. You know, it's perfect. Um, you know, there was, there, there were reasons why we, you know, she did not want to tell us those stories. But then speaking about um, other folks who are taking these stories of refugees and writing about those refugees, um, and they're the authors and that they're beneficiaries of, you know, whatever 
comes out of that book uh, on a word or you know uh, uh, money and stuff like that. Um, I really feel it is, you know, to me it's just that um, it's, it, you know it's just that I wish the uh, uh, the story was told in the first person because it has its own flavor and it spices into it when people really tell their stories because the person who's telling the story when COVID ends will, will be the one who shows up at the local library and bookstore is going to sign your book. So you're the author who actually wrote this story, uh, if it's a nonfiction. And it's about you and it's about your family. Um, and then if it's a fiction, it's just you are the, you know, the mastermind. You, you, have, you have an idea of what this story is about and all that. Um, so in, I think in short, uh, I would really prefer that if, if people who have these stories should tell their stories. Other thoughts Maybe. from Suvankam or, or, or Sasha? Suvankam, you want to go? Um, even when it's fiction, um, you, you have to make it feel real. Um, I think the power really is not you know, the writer who, who has the power to tell the story, I think the power lies in the reader. A reader has to learn how to be discerning. Like for example, um, earlier Alexander talked about um, when you tell the story of a really traumatic event, you don't, you, you, you because you survived it and you lived it, that story or that scene is one of, of triumph and incredible laughter. And I have that scene in, in one of my short stories where the father is gathered around with um, his friends and they're talking about what it was like um, being a refugee and they were trading stories that made themselves laugh. And I feel only you can, I mean, you can imagine things and you can make them up in fiction, but that moment you had to, it had to come from real knowledge, um, real lived experience. I don't, you know, I'm not interested or exploring um, refugees and immigrants as a topic. I know, um, and that is, and that comes across in the writing. And I think a discerning reader um, would be aware of that, can see that, can feel that. Yes, I, I think that um, there is a bearing witness aspect to the literature produced by well, just about everyone, right? Um, but there's a, a added value, I think, for by people who have been displaced or, or you know migrated from one place to another, because we carry our culture in our backpack, right, or on our back, in that way. And so, um, I, as uh, like Abdi, when I was writing nonfiction featuring my friends and family, I had to run it by them. It wasn't so much fact checking, but it was their story too, right? And so, you cannot simply own it. And so. I don't know who has a right, certainly not who, who I mean, legal rights when um, everyone can write whatever they want, it's freedom of speech and all that. And, um, but I think the measure to me is, um, or the difference rather is that I can write whatever book I um, write and it could be extremely successful, but if this community that I come from um, sees that book as somehow betraying or lying about their experience, right? I, I would not be able, I would not be able to um, to overcome that in my head. Right? That would be that would be a, a total um, defeat, or not defeat. It's not a battle, but rather, how would I put it, a, a fiasco, right? A, a failure of, of the writing project. And so, I don't have to. It's not that I don't have to worry about it. I'm not afraid of that because I have. Um, I cannot represent a whole people, certainly not a whole experience of war and displacement and all that. It is not up to me. It's not a, up to a single person. It has to be a kind of a, a community, a quarrel, right? The more people speak from that experience, the better, right? 
And so it, it's by necessity, um, it cannot, um, not a lot of people who are not from that community could be writing about that. And, and my, in my, I, I'm not an expert on this, but what often happens if people from the outside of the community write about refugees and, or migrants or, or all that, their modus operandi is empathy or sort of empathy poor, right? Tormenting the subject so as to generate empathy and then the, the readers, if they feel empathy, they con confirm their ethical uh, position as proper, right? Because they feel bad for these people. And so I don't write for empathy within my group of people for sure. And I don't really care outside of it as empathy because it's more than that. Would, I don't know, I mean, I will be presumptuous and say that Abdi and Suvanka might agree with this, but I don't just write because I'm a refugee or a migrant. I want to make literature, but from my experience, which is my, marked by displacement, right? So it's not just about displacement and immigrants. It is my theme, what I write about, but it, it, if it's reduced to that, it is diminished, right? But also I own it, it's mine. This is where I come from. These are my people, this is my history. This is uh, what I know. That's, um, that's beautiful, thank you, Sasha. I think the, the image, the idea of putting culture in a backpack too will, 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 will stick with me and, and as we move forward. Um, so I think we're gonna have to, to end here for, for the evening. Um, I really wanna to thank um, all of our panelists, Abdi, Sasha, Suvankam, it was a pleasure to, to engage in conversation with, with all of you. I really want to thank Penn Faulkner um, for hosting this event. And with that, I am going to bring on uh, Gwydion Sullivan, the executive director of Penn Faulkner, who's going to say uh, a few final words and, and send us off into this beautiful night. So, so thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure to speak with you all. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Matt, for uh, curating this wonderful conversation. Thanks to all of our incredible guests. I think I fell in love with all of you at different times and everything you had to say. Uh, and thanks to you all who are watching for making this another incredible literary conversation. We really could not do anything we do without you participating. I wanted to close tonight by dropping our donation link uh, back into the chat window. Uh, Penn Falker has continued to stay very strong and very hopeful throughout this pandemic. And part of what's given us that hope is the support that you all have given us. You know, books have the ability to help us all kind of bear up under difficult circumstances and keep our lives rich and keep our lives full. Books can be many things for lots of us, but uh, I hope you forgive the pun here. Books have been our refuge in a lot of ways, which is why we work really hard to put books into the hands of DC students who don't always have enough access to stories, even in good times, and for whom recent events have been particularly difficult. We want to give them the same refuge. And even $15 from you can totally transform one young person's reading life. And $15 a month, if you can manage that, it helps us do the same thing over and over again throughout the year. So thank you for being here. Thank you for anything that you can do for Penn Faulkner so that we can do good things for others. And uh, we hope you take care. We hope you enjoyed tonight's literary conversation. Have a good night.